But what happens is um, when we're not intentional about the possessions that we bring into our life, when we're not intentional about the time commitments that we commit to, when we're not intentional about what we spend our money on, when we're not intentional about uh, even the habits that we bring into our life, that this is when uh, I think we start to feel almost like someone has come along and hijacked our passions and directed it towards things that that don't matter, uh, things that we wouldn't have directed them to. Today's podcast is going to blow your mind. Today's guest is so inspiring. And also at the same time, I feel so zen. I, I'm honestly blown away and I cannot wait for you to hear. So buckle up and prepare to have your life changed. Hey Clutterbugs, welcome back to the Clutterbug Podcast. I am beyond excited for today's guest. We have the incredible Joshua Becker. Joshua is a Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestselling author of five books. He's also the founder of Becoming Minimalist, a website dedicated to intentional living that's visited over one million times by 1 million readers every single month. And he has a social media following of over 3 million people. His blog has been named by Success Magazine as one of the top 10 personal development websites on the internet. And his writing has been featured all over the world. I like to think of him as the king of minimalism. Joshua Becker is making it mainstream and making us all want to embrace a more simplified, minimal lifestyle. So welcome, Joshua Becker. I am absolutely fangirling over here. Thrilled to have you. It's such an honor. Thank you for being on the Clutterbug podcast. Well, you are overly gracious. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. I'm excited. I always love getting to getting to chat with people. I'm I'm especially excited i'm actually friends with don from the minimal mom and i'm going to tell you the truth don't don't be insulted for a really long time i had a negative impression of what minimalism was i thought it was someone with maybe one plate a fork over there bare walls and i'm really discovering it's so much more and i also am seeing that minimalism kind of looks different to different people and I'm curious, have you always been a minimalist? Is this something that you grew up with? How did this happen for you? Because you are you are the leader of the movement. You are bringing this mainstream. You are opening people's eyes to something and I think changing their perspective too. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully it's certainly something I'm, I'm passionate about. Um, no, didn't grow up this way. I always uh, like to think I grew up pretty typical middle class, not eating at the fanciest restaurants in town, but never missing meals along the way either. Um, 14 years ago is when I was introduced to minimalism. And the short story is it was a Saturday morning. We were doing our spring cleaning. My son was five. My daughter was two. And I had this vision of my five-year-old son helping me clean out the garage. We were going to have this amazing day together. And he lasted about 30 seconds and was in the backyard. I, uh, of course, had the garage as my project. And so hours and hours I'm putting into the garage, just taking everything out and hosing it all down. My son's asking me every about 15, 20 minutes if I'll come back and play catch with him. And I keep pushing him off, pushing him off as as this happens. Um, My neighbor then was the one who introduced me to minimalism. I started complaining to her. She was doing all of her yard work and I started complaining about my garage project and how long it was taking. And then she had seen the interaction with with my son. Anyway, uh, she says one simple sentence. uh, You know, that's why my daughter's a minimalist. She keeps telling me I don't need to own all this stuff. And I remember looking at the pile of things in my driveway, dirty and dusty and 
things that I knew weren't making me happy, right? Or at least I would say isn't making me happy. Um, out of the corner of my eye, I see my five-year-old son swinging alone on the swing set in the backyard where he'd been all day long and suddenly had this further realization. Not only were my things not making me happy, but all my things were actually taking me away from the very thing that did bring me happiness and purpose and meaning and fulfillment in life. And so that was the start of our journey. Um, and I, I always think that's the that's the light bulb moment for minimalism. Like we would all say our things aren't making us happy, but the moment we realize they're actually taking us away from the very things that do bring us happiness is what sparks the idea and sparks the thought to why do I own all this stuff and what can I start getting rid of? I, I love that. Every time I read any of your messages, any any anything you put out do you know what i feel i feel ah, that i feel the weight lifting off even when i haven't done the work yet that must be what your life feels like but that's what we all should feel like and you say something you say minimalism is the freedom from the passion to possess and as much as i declutter i'm not I'm not there yet. I still feel that passion to possess. Please help us. Why do we feel this? And how can we stop looking for happiness in a store? Yeah. Um, you're brilliant. You uh, you you ask meaningful questions that have all this truth in them uh, right right off the bat. So I'm sorry. Um, I'm, th I'm just throwing them at you. I'm like solve no, it's, solve it's, the it's, world's it's, problems, Joshua. You're like this is good. This is good. And um, uh, first of all, uh, yes, like minimalism is freedom. Uh, owning less is freedom. And I think sometimes we can even think of the process of decluttering as being burdensome and not freeing, but something that I have to do, something that I don't want to do, something that I know I should be doing, but like feel forced into it. And it's interesting because like I grew up, I, I grew up going to church and like in a very faith-filled home and environment and like I had heard about not being materialistic and not being consumeristic and not, you know, being greedy and selfish. And like, I had heard all of those messages, but for some reason they were always like, um, like the negative side of the consequence, like, like don't be materialistic. Don't be over consumeristic. Um, don't spend more than you have. Like it's always the the negative side as opposed to the very freeing, hey, if you owned less, you could free up your life. You could free up money and time and energy and you could start uh, living the life that you actually want to be living rather than the uh, the one that the world that consume that marketers are just telling us to telling us to live in. Um, so yeah, how do you overcome the, the passion to possess? It's a, in some ways, I think it's a, a, a different conversation than how do I declutter? Um, how do I overcome consumerism is I always think the, the comparison is it's one thing to go on a diet to lose 10 pounds. It's something completely different to embrace a healthy diet going forward for the rest of my life. And um, the greatest benefit, of course, is in the healthy diet, not just the decluttering and then filling, filling back up again. But yeah, how do we do that? I, I think we recognize we we start living it like we start owning less and noticing the benefits of it. I think we start realizing that our lives are worth more than physical possessions. I think we start seeing that our money can be used for bigger and better things than just buying more and more stuff. Uh, I think the more we embrace gratitude and generosity, the more we're able to overcome consumerism. I think we just notice, hey, we live in this society that is compelling us to buy things that we don't need. 5,000 advertisements we see every single day. Um, and, 5, and they all every day. Yeah. And, and really when you think about it, the heart of every advertisement is, Hey, you're, you'll be happier if you buy this thing, your life will be better if you buy this 
product. And I think we just get told that message so many times that we very subtly begin to believe it and start living lives where we constantly want bigger houses and nicer cars and more clothes and cuter this and faster that. And it just becomes uh, what we pursue, unfortunately. I think you're right. So, I mean, there's one thing to say, change your mindset, but what you're saying is it's the messaging has a big impact on your mindset too. So if everywhere we see and everything we hear is telling us a message, of course, we're going to gravitate to that. And I changed my finances listening to messages from Dave Ramsey from, I mean, I was reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. The more I listened to that message, the more my brain gravitated to that message. I think what you're saying is everyone needs to listen to you more. That's what you're, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You know, but, I'll let you but say that. honestly, but, but I'll let, but let honestly, me add hearing that message. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add one piece onto it. You know, it's, um, we certainly live in a world where we're told all these, um, marketing messages, um, but I, I like to say there's no there's no progress to be made in blame, uh, like there's no ad executive driving you to target, you know, there's no ad executive clicking to ship on on Amazon like those messages are somehow resonating with something inside of us right the the way we grew up or a, a little more jealousy or envy or uh, trying to you know, fit into society or the, the people that we hang around with or prove our success to, to people like there's there's some internal unhealthy motivations that those advertisements are grabbing onto that compel us to buy. And so I think both, you know, both are important to understand and diagnose and neither are easy. The internal one is harder than, you know, trying to trying to just blame Madison Avenue. But you know, the reality is that um, there's something going on inside of us that, that we need to look at as well. Yeah, filling that void. You're right. Oh, God, that feels close to therapy and uncomfortable <laughs> feelings, Joshua. I don't like that. Close, to, like close to more like just encouraging therapy, not, a, not, oh. a, not actually doing any. <laughs> so you but. don't just have a pill, a pill I can take to fix my problems overnight. That's a bummer. That's a, uh, but I, I feel like I'm getting there through practice. I, I really do. And I don't know if I'll ever be a true minimalist that in my mind, right, I have this mm. perception of what being a minimalist is, but I probably let go of 80% of my belongings. And I'm in a place now where it takes me five minutes to tidy a room and they never get out of control. I never have to spend a Saturday cleaning the garage or cleaning anything and that feels like a little bit of freedom, but it's also like you get a taste and you want more. I want more because you talk a lot about minimalism, not just being freedom from your possessions, but simplifying so many other areas like time commitments and just your goals even, which I love because it's what's weighing, what feels suffocating. And, and every time pe people talk about their stuff and clutter and just life, you hear words like drowning, I'm suffocating, I can't breathe. And I feel like those words to describe that is so telling because it is this crushing from above feeling um, when we have too much on our plate, when we're overwhelmed. And so I'd love if you talk to us about maybe I'm putting you on the spot again, but some ways that we can simplify, just simple. What can we do to simplify our lives? Well, I have found um, uh, a great substitute word for minimalism is the word intentionality. That um, my desire is to be intentional with the things that I own. I want to own the things that help me live the life I want to live. And I want to get rid of the things that distract me from the life that I want to live or the, the burden, the drowning, the suffocating that, that keeps me from the things that are truly important to me. I'm, I'm pretty convinced that if you sit across the table from anybody and ask them, like, what do you most want to accomplish with your life? Like, no one says, I just want a house full of clutter. Like, no one says, I just want to have as much stuff as I possibly can. Maybe a few people would say that, but 
most people when you deep down we I mean, we all talk about the same thing we talk about love and we talk about relationships and we talk about family and making a difference and these are the things that are are really most important to us but what happens is um when we're not intentional about the possessions that we bring into our life when we're not intentional about the time commitments that we commit to when we're not intentional about what we spend our money on when we're not intentional about uh, even the habits that we bring into our life that this is when uh, i think we start to feel almost like someone has come along and hijacked our passions and directed it towards things that that don't matter uh, things that we wouldn't have directed them to so in, in a lot of ways i think minimalism is about bringing back intentionality uh, into life. Um, I, I like to define it as removing uh, anything that distracts us from um, our, our greatest values. And so how do we do that? I, I think that we find, I think that we find one, one small area of life um, and, and we start taking back intentionality. And I find that intentionality in one area tends to bring about intentionality in other areas. Um, I'm, I'm sure you can probably see the same thing in your life. You know, for me, I started minimizing my possessions. I started getting rid of the things that just unintentionally accumulated in my home. And um, suddenly I started looking at, hey, how, you know, am I, am I eating healthy? Am I taking care of myself? You know, what are the commitments I'm taking on at work? And what's the reason behind them? And why have I committed to all these things? Are they actually serving me or uh, are they taking me away from the life that I wish I was living instead? So anyway, uh, I, yeah, I, I think minimizing possessions is a great place to, to start to just bring back uh, intentionality. Pick, pick one room, pick, pick your car, pick your living room and just pick your bedroom, like pick the easiest space and get rid of anything in that space that doesn't serve a purpose and um, I think you'll start to uh, notice a change happening in your home and uh, eventually in your life. A lot of people say to me, what if I regret? What if I have regrets? What if I make a mistake? There is a lot. I've seen, I've worked with thousands of clients and it really, a lot of the time does come down to fear and anxiety about doing the wrong thing. I think we all want what you have, but there is this underlying, well, what if I do it wrong? What if I make a mistake? And in my own, I'm, I mean, in my own life, there's nothing that I really regret. I mean, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there's things I've decluttered that I'm like, oh man, I probably needed that, but I can't think of even one. So was it really that important? But I'm sure you've sort of encountered this same fear-based uh, sort of visceral effect that we have when it comes to letting things go. Do you have advice? My advice is always push through the fear. I know it's scary, but we can't run away from scary things, but you're much cleverer than I am. Joshua. So, <laughs> Well, um, I think, I think sometimes we fear the wrong thing. Like we, uh, we fear, what if I get rid of something you know, what if I regret making this change in my life? Um, well, what about the fear that you're missing out on living your best life because you haven't made these changes? Um, or to to think in terms of possessions, it's, you know, what if, well, what if I get rid of something that I end up needing um, at some point down the road? And like you, like you, my story is the same. Like I, I'm sure there's something, but I can't really think of what that what that might be. Um, rather than thinking, yeah, but what if I get rid of something that I end up needing? Yeah, but what if I end up living my life holding on to a thousand things that I don't ever end up needing? Like usually that's how it is. We get rid of a thousand things and there's just one of them that we ended up needing and we regret the one thing rather than noticing uh, how much life we've freed up by getting rid of the 999 other things. And so, um, yeah, I, uh, fear is pretty powerful and uh, very motivating and can be very helpful at times. Uh, I just think sometimes we have to be careful to make sure we're actually fearful of the right things and that we're directing fear towards the towards the right places. And we have a we have a tendency to think that 
you know, the decisions that we've made in the past are correct, uh, as opposed to thinking, you know what, maybe there's a whole new way of life that I'm just now being introduced to that I haven't ever considered uh, and might change my life entirely for the better. I, I literally want to go, I want to go fill some trash bags right now. I'm feeling, <laughs> I declutter all the time, but this is what I need. We need to hear the message about digging a little deeper because the difference between my life now and when I had a house full, the real difference is time. And this is something you can't really explain it's so hard to explain to someone because you can't conceptualize this until you've lived it. But I went from a life where I felt busy and hectic all the time to freeing up enough time to create a business, to engage in tons of hobbies, to actually visit friends and family. And the only thing that really is different is I have less stuff. And it doesn't seem like, why are these extra plates taking away time? And how is this stuffed animals all over my kid's bed actually costing me time? But it is. It, it it's, it's fractions of a second that add up to minutes, that add up to hours, that add up to days that your stuff is stealing from you. Mm -hmm. But how do we, how can we, really convince people of this or is this something that you just have to fill a box and feel it i'm putting you on the spot again i uh i agree entirely um with your premise um uh to a degree that you uh i can't even express i, I the way i say it is um we cannot understand the burden of our possessions until we begin to remove them uh like the like the proverbial frog in the pot where the where the water's getting hotter like we just collect more and more and it just feels normal it feels like this is what life is supposed to be like until we make a change until we start getting rid of the things that we don't need and suddenly we're shocked I'm just the same as you, shocked at how much time I have in my life. Um, it's cleaning and organizing and maintaining and managing, repairing, replacing. But um, it's even more than that. It's all the time that we spend on the front end thinking about having to do the cleaning or thinking about the thing that we want to go buy or we want to get and researching the price and rushing out to get it and thinking oh, i'll just return it and then we have to take another trip to the store to return it or or whatever it might be and um man as soon as you free yourself up from that you um you are right like I, my business today is because of freeing myself up to to doing that there's not a doubt in my mind that most of the things that I've uh, accomplished in my life, not just professionally, but in my faith and in my family I, is, is directly tied to um, freeing, up, freeing up my life. The New York Times uh, recently called the modern American generation the most tired, rushed, stressed, hurried generation of all time. And uh, there's not a doubt in my mind that that is because we have just owned more possessions than anyone at any point in human history like any point in human history no human being has owned as much stuff as we do today and how do you help people see that i i don't know i, I tend to think people people know it like like they don't connect it to their possessions necessarily but they know hey I'm just really tired and really stressed and really busy. And I wish I had more time to play on the floor with my kid. I, I wish I had more time to volunteer. I wish I had more money to give. Um, and I think maybe the, the moment we see, hey, maybe it's all the stuff that you've collected around you that's keeping you from doing those things. It tends to tends to resonate. I think it tends to flip a switch in, in people's lives. I, I sometimes say I'm my job is just to remind people of something that they already know to be true, that that our lives are too valuable to waste chasing and accumulating material possessions. Oh, my God, that's so good, because 
Yeah, we have robots that vacuum for us. We have dishwashers. We have we have technology to make life easier, and yet life is harder. And right, we have all this conveniences to make our lives easier, and yet it's harder. Yet our homes are messier. We're 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 we have less money than right. And just what is happening? And when you look at the real differences between yesterday and today's generations, it's stuff. It's stuff. It, it, on paper, we should be killing the game. We should be happier and have so much more free time. The core difference is the excess of stuff. Yeah, That's I agree. Place, Joshua. I, I, I agree. I always think my grandma is like the perfect example of this. My grandma is the best cook that I've ever known in my entire life. And her kitchen was like a third of the size of ours. She had like a third of the kitchen tools that we have today and all this stuff that was supposed to make cooking better and easier uh, has actually made us worse cooks. Like there's just something to be found in having a few simple tools that we know how to use that are multifunctional and we get good at them rather than thinking the next kitchen gadget is going to make me a better cook or the next cleaning thing is finally going to free me up from having uh, having to clean uh, almost in any and every case uh, they just add burden rather than uh, subtracting it you're you're a genius and i'm going to listen to you every day on repeat but right now because i have you trapped i'm going to use you as a therapist because you are good at this okay mm -hmm. here's my biggest issue when it comes to clutter and a lot of people's when it comes to clutter i purchase things that a little bit makes me proud if this makes sense so i love to craft when i create something i feel so good it feels good and at one of the core core things for overall emotional happiness is pride. We need to feel that. But I tend to then try to shortcut it by buying the supplies to feel the pride instead of engaging in the activity that makes me feel proud. But I justify this with the fact that, well, I need the supplies. And so whether you're a book lover and you're collecting books because being well-read makes you feel proud or you're a crafter or you love to, I don't know, exercise and you're collecting things because the, the possession does have a small bit of importance in the overall prideful act of the thing we're doing, but it muddies the waters. And now when I walk into my craft room, I'm so overwhelmed by all the stuff that I'm not even crafting. And I think I've answered my own question, but I want to hear it from you. I mean, can we have our cake and eat it too? Can we have the stuff that makes us feel proud? But then why is it making us feel sad at the same time? Sure. Well, you just, yes, you answered your own question. And even just in your phrasing right there, um, it's not owning the stuff that makes you proud. It's the, the act of creating is where you find, where you find the pride. Um, and so it is, I think, easy to become, uh, to get caught up, to mistake the purchasing of the supplies for the hobby to actually um, then actually fulfilling the fulfilling the hobby, whatever it might be. I like I have a, a, I'd like to think that I'm a reader. I have a ton of books that that I haven't read. And I don't know, it makes me feel like I'm smart because I'm buying the book, but it actually doesn't help me until I go through with the reading of it. And uh, I, I think it's a big one when it when it comes to hobbies, you know, like we, we collect all the stuff and it doesn't help us enjoy the hobby more. It becomes a distraction from the hobby, uh, rather than actually, actually living it out. Um, you know, arts, uh, craft and arts, I always think is a, an interesting case. Um, Orson Welles, uh, the great filmmaker once said, uh, the enemy of art is the absence of limitations. And uh, I think that that's helpful for people to to think through. We sometimes think the more supplies we have, the better artist we're going to be. Uh, but in reality, sometimes art is best created and most created when 
when we have just the things in front of us and we're going to create with the supplies that we have, we're going to do our crafts with the things that we have uh, in front of us as opposed to run, rushing to the store to buy something and then never actually fulfilling yeah. the fulfilling the craft. Because it does take, it takes from being able to fulfill the thing. And at, I mean, at, because you're a book lover, I love that you said that, that it makes you feel smart because it's all, it's all tied to your identity too. I identify as a crafter and then therefore my stuff feels like an extension of my being as I'm sure books do for you. It feels like part of you and your coreness. And a lot of people feel this, whether they're a chef and they love to cook or they love to, whatever it is that encompasses them and they feel, your belongings feel like an extension. But I guess you can still be an artist and a crafter without having to keep all the arts. You are still going to be a book lover without having to keep every book that you've ever purchased. And so that's such a good message, Joshua. Thank you. It's such a good message. I want to talk about one last thing before I let you go. I love your, whenever, when I read this, when I read this, it like stopped me a little bit. You said, don't just declutter, de-own. And I don't know why those words really resonated with me, but it did. The idea of de-owning something feels freeing. The word declutter feels like work. The word de-owning to me feels like empowerment. Is that why you're kind of, is that your message? Was that your intent? Um, my intent was, uh, um, and yeah, people love that um, quote and love that article. Um, my intent was, I think, to um, look at the difference between temporary solutions and, and permanent solutions. Um, and I think in its truest sense, decluttering is, hey, I'm getting rid of things that I don't need. But a lot of people, when they think of decluttering, they're just like reorganizing stuff or they're just getting rid of like the surface level clutter that I know I, I don't need. Um, but the process of like really rethinking ownership and, and really removing ownership of an item is is a very permanent solution like we organize our stuff today and we just have to reorganize it again tomorrow or as courtney carver once said don't you think if organizing was the solution you'd be done by now i, I always think that that's so that's so brilliant um just it's moving so stuff around so just harsh. Hold, yeah yes just holding on to all this stuff never solves the problem um, but when we rethink Hey, what am I owning? What am I keeping? Do I need this? Um, what is actually serving a purpose in my life? What is helping me become the person I want to be? And what is just keeping me from it? And then removing that is, it's, it's an act of permanence. It's, it's a, it frees up physical space in our home and mental space in our mind. And it's opportunity for generosity. And um, it, I think it, it really starts to blaze blaze a path for life change um, when we really start rethinking what do I own and why do I own it uh, as opposed to just getting rid of the surface level stuff or just finding a better cuter box to, to put it all in. I'm inspired. I mean, you're absolutely brilliant and you have such a calming Oh, you're just like, I just want to do whatever you say. So um, no. <laughs> thank you. I'm going to go and own some of my craft supplies. I feel zen and motivated at the same time, which is a very rare and beautiful combination to have. So thank you, Joshua. Thank you so much for just being here. And I know you've inspired every single person who's listening to this podcast. Please let my listeners know how they can find you and hear more and all the amazing ways that you can change their life for the better. Uh, I'm a lot of different places. Becomingminimalist.com is home base for me. Uh, certainly involved on YouTube and Facebook and uh, Twitter and have um, plenty of books and a couple magazines that, um, that I publish. But um, yeah, everything rolls through becomingminimalist.com. So I'll send people there. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next time.